In relationship to the power of language, I wanted to bring up a topic, an idea for thought. The idea of emotional literacy. As a teacher, one of the things that I always prided myself on was being emotionally candid in my classroom. I'm a literature teacher, so it totally helped when discussing poetry, when discussing writing techniques, when even talking about rhetoric, we had articulations around the language we could use to describe certain things. It really was helpful to students. It really was helpful to the environment in my classroom. And it was doubly helpful for me as, a, as an individual to be able to use emotional responses in making connections and building relationships with students. I don't think that I was alone in that, but I think that as an English teacher, I had a, um, the privilege and the space in my classroom to be able to utilize that. Maslow's hierarchy was up on my wall. You could reference different points of literature to maybe draw um, analogies or parallels between how you felt today. And we were constantly talking about how what we were reading, what we were writing, what we were hearing made us feel. It was very helpful. I think the reason why I might have been comfortable with this is my own journey um, before entering into a space as a classroom teacher, my own journey in healing some inner child trauma. So I had actually been doing some work and articulating some things that, you know, as a, an adult, sometimes we can kind of get lost in the hustle and neglect. But I think some of this work, recognizing there's um, neurological components, uh, coping mechanisms and behavior can be appearing in different ways, um, and really understanding the biological fundamental relationship between what you've experienced and how you feel and how you emote, and then maybe how you express yourself with others. So given that, my interest in emotional intelligence, my interest in articulating emotions or emotional literacy, and maybe my just natural inclination to lead with empathy. Um, I found it very helpful in my classroom, very unhelpful in my profession. I was constantly feeling like this was an area of study or an area of um, import that m maybe hadn't reached the crest for other people to become as invested in what that felt like as a classroom um, teacher or as a department or as a school community. I feel like I was always raising my hand and saying, but, but, but emotions, <laughs> but, but, but childhood trauma. Um, and I, I took great pleasure in the fact that I did know that there were spaces where this was um, valued um, and where those types of conversations could be had. I knew that it wasn't just, uh, you know, I was the odd person out and it, that doesn't exist. But I was exhausted in trying to convince other people that it had a place in um, our academic environment. Needless to say, I in my career have had opportunities to lead with this interest um, in becoming a performing arts teacher, in guiding students around how they express themselves creatively, and I've been in spaces where students taught me as much, if not more, than I was ready to teach them about what this meant and how um, life-changing it can be to be in a space that is emotionally supportive as well as the other things. This could look very different. This could look like um, we could take into consideration the language around pronouns. Now, I know that this is one of those debates that lots of people think they know all about. They don't need any more discussion around it. But if you think about what it means to enunciate and pronounce someone's name correctly, how much 
that helps a person feel seen. Imagine that same dichotomy, that same weight of emotional uh, validity given to the way you want to be seen by the world in totality. I think about um, a seventh grader that I taught who halfway through the year announced that she wanted to be known as Lavender. Just a, a name change and recognizing, as she told me, that other teachers weren't really calling her Lavender, but she wanted to be known as Lavender. I also recognized that in this young person's um, life at the time, she was going through an emotional transition where she was leaving foster care, going with um, a more stable household. And this was part and parcel of her new identity as a young person given a second chance. Yes, in my classroom, she was Lavender, absolutely. And that validation that she had in my classroom with effort from her peers, with effort from some supportive other teachers, she could feel seen, she could feel loved, she could feel valued, she could feel understood. If nowhere else than on school property where she was referred to by the name that she chose. Absolutely. Then I think about how difficult some people are feeling about including pronouns, including emotional um, work in our classrooms and what the pushback actually is saying. A lot of the time the pushback is, there's no, there's no room, we're already overloaded in classrooms, we're already doing enough, that's the type of stuff that you go see a therapist or you talk to your parents. But I don't think some of the people that are saying those types of things are in classrooms and see just the how emotionally heightened things can be with growing young people. And I'm not just talking about um, your average adolescent melodrama. I'm talking about what our young people are experiencing today, what it feels like to be in a classroom today, and how all of the coping mechanisms that might help you Avoid getting into trouble on the way to school. Um, avoid you looking like a chump that needs to um, get messed with on the playground. Or um, the bravado that you need to just show that everything's okay, uh, I'm, I'm not suffering. Those can be um, displayed in so many different caustic ways. And for our young people, I really worry that they have school leadership that understands what the difference between is a coping mechanism and a behavior disruption and can actually take those things into consideration when supporting a young person. There, over the last 20 years or so, has been a lot of talk around the school to prison pipeline. The idea that young people can come into classroom spaces and exhibit some of the most disruptive, uh, disagreeable, behavior in an effort to be getting help, in an effort to actually play out the drama of their internal emotional existence in a space that is meant to be there for them and an environment that is meant to encourage them to process through those situations or growth spurts or transitions of life into a more achievable, functional young person, right? But if our school environments are now changing to become virtual, distant, removed, remote, and if our education curricula is now becoming fought over, which books are we banning? What stories are we leaving out of the narrative that students are exposed to? Or are we teaching both sides of the Holocaust so that students really understand what was going on in a way that actually rewrites a lot of our history? Are we completely excluding conversations that have to do with what the world looks like outside? Are we not giving students the validation to be who they are 
in the space that we're asking them to feel accepted and learn, learn in. And who is doing that teaching? Is it someone who really has a commitment, a passion, a drive to be there for young people and to guide them through not only the academic year, but to have lifelong relationships with young people so that they always know that they can double back and lean on someone that has been there for them. I think about how many students wanted to um, connect with teachers that they had previously and how many of those teachers had moved on and not just moved on to different schools, but left the whole profession of education entirely. And there was a student looking for a college recommendation or some kind of, you know, uh, pat on the back around some award that had been given and how many empty seats they were finding because we weren't supporting our teachers. I think about that and I think about who might be in your child's classroom and how you can advocate for your child and how your child can advocate for themselves as well. It might be as simple as having conversations with school leadership that look more like developing bonds that can be utilized throughout the school year. Um, it might look like getting involved in what's going on at school. It might look like finding out a little bit more about what the student is learning or sourcing out other areas where the student can get needs met that you feel might be neglected in the school classroom space. I say this because as a classroom teacher with a limited ability to change the world, <laughs> I try to focus on my community and I want you to focus on yours as well. I try to focus on building a community network that's sustainable, that people know that they can, like I said, double back, get information, ask the silly questions and feel that they're supported. I also want to make sure that students are not um, in situations where only the privileged are getting the support that they need, where we really are trying to find ways to give back to students that are losing resources. Are there books you could be donating? Is there um, a neighborhood bookstore that has events that you could just maybe do some reposting online and, and maybe spread the word about what other options people have to make sure that they're connected as a community and that education is coming first. I think about that. I think about how we can build sustainable emotional literacy within our communities and how we can start with ourselves by doing that work first here before spreading it around in abundance. Just something to think about. Thank you for listening.